it's like I heard McEnroe today just like <laughs> shitting <laughs> shitting on everyone, dude. Yeah. Must like I think anyone who's not like Djokovic, Federer, and the yeah, is dude, like, it's a journey, man. Yeah, yeah man, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I know. It's it's pretty ratchet. So Johnny Mac, if you're watching this, bro, you gotta chill out. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Change Over Podcast. We are in Laval, Canada this week. Um, if this is your first time here, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Comment, share. Yeah, comment down below who you think we should have on, other guests we should have on. Uh, my name is Jody, this is Justin. And today we have a guest from New Zealand. He's a member of the New Zealand Davis Cup team. He played Division II tennis at Columbus State University. He's won a few Futures titles this year and also have the capability of winning matches at bigger events. For example, Washington last year where he um, qualified at the 500 and he currently sits at about 450 in the world. Welcome KP Panu to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a great part and I'm real happy to be here with you guys. You've watched? Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not huge into like the tennis pods or the tennis content really because I feel like it's just so much of our lives, but I really do enjoy your guys' content, so I'm happy to be here. Right, appreciate, appreciate that, yeah. yeah. Um, how's, uh, how's Laval treating you? We talked a little bit about the Airbnb. Yeah, yeah, so far so good. The weather's definitely a lot nicer than Atlanta, where I've been. Got stitched up with the Airbnb this week, but it happens, you know, you can't win them all, so... What happened? So, Explain to the... Well, I tried to be organized and get an airbnb early and get like a uh insurance on it in case i didn't end up wanting it and ended up finding housing um and then found out the insurance policy was just so strict that i couldn't get out of it so ended up fumbling the bag like a 1200 dollar airbnb for the week and got um, you twice <laughs> yeah yeah got me so it's all right take it on the chin and um yeah just hope hope for better airbnbs in the future yeah real. you hit here yet yeah, I had, see what they call it, yeah. Yeah, today we got like 30 minutes on site and then we got booted off because someone had a match and we went to the public courts down the road and they were actually okay. But uh, I would say probably not an ideal like court situation this week. Yeah. There's like two practice courts and it's all half court. So, um, But the public courts were great. So that was a bonus for sure. They made like, I, I don't remember, I think last year this second they, they, so right now there's a stadium so okay. you know like this center court where they have all the stands yeah last year they didn't have stands there that you could practice on that court too okay so like we had one more practice court last year than in this uh, year. okay oh, but it is rare how they have a setup where you can like practice on the court that's right next to the match court that's yeah. not normally what they do at these tournaments but and there's only two courts to practice oh yeah it is what it is to practice somewhere no i'm saying it is what it is but it's not it's not normal yeah they like, wouldn't do that it's yeah that's in jamaica though yeah, Jamaica was it was a grind for sure. Um, a lot, I'd say, a lot of these futures. You just the best thing that I've found is to just wake up early. You know, the six a.m.s which suck, but you know, try to get the practice session in before that first match goes on. Yeah. That way, at least you're guaranteed a full court. You know, you can get your work in, but it's definitely not ideal. You know, having to wake up at five thirty to get a practice, but that's kind of what I've been doing. Dominican. Like have to do that. I feel like it's also better there in those hot places because you practice before it gets unbearable. True. Yeah. Yeah. That's another good reason as well. Yo. By the way, have you seen any of his results? Like this man will be literally dying on the court playing three setters. Like every tournament, this man is dying. I heard that. Like literally dying. I played yeah. doubles in Dominican. He's throwing up in between points. Like physically, literally dying and just keep going. Like, sacrificing the body. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been crazy. I, I've actually been kind of unlucky this year i feel like with being sick i've been sick like at least four or five times and i've gone to the 20s and just tried to battle it out i don't feel too bad for you i've seen the results yeah <laughs> Dude, honestly, oh, with all these futures oh it's so unlucky i think i think it's kind of helped a little bit because like i've been so dead during these matches that i just can't think you know it's just like sea ball hit ball and sometimes that helps you know whereas i'll look at my opponent and they're fresh, but they're like kind of overthinking things and tired. And I'm just like survival mode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. So it's kind of worked in my favor, but I hope, um, yeah, I'll be over the kind of grinding to the death. 
is that what happened in I, it was in Dominican that happened yeah and then I actually it happened in Dominican twice I think because one time I was there and then the other time you posted the story I think after you won and you literally look like a zombie so like, dude that was cr that was crazy but yeah both times Dominican first time I got sick at the 25s and tried to play and just died had to pull out the next week and then the second time round I was doing all right kind of cruising through you know some of the rounds and then the final I was just cooked it was so hot um almost had matchy in the second lost the second 4-1 down just thought the match was over and I was okay with it you know um somehow came back and then died after the match full body cramp they were telling me we need to take you to the hospital <laughs> I was like no like please I'm here by myself no you know no coach no real friends as well because everyone had dipped out yeah it's on the last day of the tournament so yeah the everyone gone and they were gonna send me to the hospital and honestly they had these three nurses and they nursed me back to life it was actually pretty insane because for those who are full body cramped it's it's pretty gnarly you know my feet went first and they were locking up and um, you know, I was freaking out cause I was, you know, in the Dominican about to go to hospital and I was just like, fuck. The this, worst this, is when you, is when you're cramping in the front, they get just get someone who can try to bend your leg. Oh, uh, and the back. <laughs> dude, it was mental, dude. Like, I don't want to go into too much detail cause it's going to go online, but like, yeah. it was pretty grim in there. Like, yeah, they really had to nurse me back to life, but. Yeah, uh, this is life on tour, you know, yeah. who's stronger from it, I guess. And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is what they say. But so these these conditions should be a little bit better for you. Like, <laughs> I can't imagine you're going to die in the, in this world. I, I hope not. No, definitely um, the hot weather is not my favorite and I struggle. Yeah. Like, I, I think I have a little bit of like a heat intolerance, but I've been having to go to the Caribbean because, you know, that's where... I feel like the best opportunity is in terms of the draws and it's also what is most affordable, you know, for my budget. So, you know, so far it's been good and I've gotten some good results. So I hope that um, I won't have to go back. To the Caribbean at all? Well, I would love to go back, but you know, back to, yeah, yeah. hopefully I'll be vacationing next time and not grinding three hour matches. Three hours is least. Like when when I played you in doubles, I'm pretty sure you played a four hour match. Yeah. That time. Yeah. And then, so I, he played a four hour match, three sets. I believe he won. I believe he won the match. And yeah. then I played him in doubles that day, and he's like a zombie on the court, barely walking around, but still like playing well. We win the first. I think we're serving for the first, maybe five four. Yeah. And in between points, you're throwing up. You know. So brutal. So brutal. And it's such a tough position because. In doubles, I was playing with my friend Henry, and I just don't want to be a bad friend, you know, and let him down because I know he's there just for doubles, and I know I'm cooked, and my coach is telling me you sh you shouldn't play, you know, it's not safe. I don't want to take you to the hospital, <clears throat> so it's not a great position. But then once I started throwing up, you know, Henry was like, okay, you know, yeah. let's call it. He said on my behalf, and I was like, but he was smart because like I believe. He might have went to the bathroom to give you more break. Yeah. And you were dying and you were like, no, let's go, let's go. And like, he called it. Yeah. It's like, if he, and then you actually won the next day in three sets again against Roberto Sid. I don't know if you remember. Just yeah. crazy. The night before, Rob texted me about about you. Yeah. And I said, whatever. But but the game, and then I said, I heard that he had a, yeah. he was pretty sick today. No, so Rob makes the meet. I told him, make it physical. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Crazy. texted me too. The worst thing is that Rob texted me and I said, yeah, like he was throwing up during the match. Like he was pretty tired. I didn't tell him anything besides that, you know, but I told yeah. him, yeah, he's pretty tired. He's throwing up in the match. Day. I didn't even know you were going to plan on playing the next day. I thought you were literally dead. Yeah. And then the next day I show up and you're up a break in the third and I don't want <laughs> Rob. I don't want Rob to see me. You know? So I don't even go to the match. I just keep walking, you know, because if Rob sees me, it's like, I don't want to be the one to tell him. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea because that match, I think I won it 6-0 in the third because he died yeah. in the third. You know, I, I just have no idea how how I managed to outlast him. And I don't know, I think, yeah, I have no idea. I just pray to God, <laughs> honestly, and just put it in his hands sometimes, you know. And if I feel like I need to def, I will. But I'm also very stubborn, 
which is also a bad thing. Like I almost ended up in the hospital, but trying to get better at learning to when to say enough is enough because it's so hard, you know, this is our life and you're there and you just, it's hard to quit. At least for me. That's like a Australian and New Zealand thing. Mm, I'm not sure. I, I think it might be to do with my personality a little bit. Like I'm quite stubborn, you know, in lots of areas of life, but. Yeah, dude, I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go uh, hoodie off. But you want to yeah. knock it for your head? There's something behind your tissue. Behind you, or you can wait the oh, I'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fine. I just feel myself sweating. <laughs> I'm out here grinding you know, on the pod as well. You need a crump in the pod. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Full body cramp on the pod. Hey guys, quick break. Justin here from The Changeover. I'm going to talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25-30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with, fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag, no issues at TSA. It's a big money saver, and you can save even more when you use our code changeover to get $100 off the machine. Back to the episode. All right, you want to get into the game, Justin? Let's Yo, I got some uh, topics for you. Sweet. We're going to see if they're over or underrated in your opinion. Okay. Number one, body language. Like when I was in school, our coach talked a lot about body language, like not showing the opponent any weakness and always, I guess, projecting something positive and confident. So in your opinion, is body language over or underrated? Underrated. Um, I think... A lot of tennis can be a poker match, you know. I've like, for example, in the Dominican, uh, I lo- ended up losing the match, but first round I was cooked again, you know, same old, same old. But my friend told me the other guy was cooked, and I couldn't really see it. He was hiding it really well, but my friend telling me that it just gave me that extra bit of confidence to push, you know, that next game, and then I won. I ran away with the set, so. I think tennis is like the margins are tiny and if you give away that 1%, it can be the difference between winning and losing. And so I would say underrated. Are you good at hiding when you're upset as well? Not just tired? Or... Um, I try to be, but I would say probably not. Okay. Um, but I definitely, I'm definitely mindful of it. You know, if I'm going to like lean on the fence or bend over, I'll kind of peep if my opponent's looking or he's walking to his towel. Um, so I'm definitely conscious of, of it. Going on with you? Yeah, I agree. But I believe also not only because of being physically tired, but also confidence. Like, I don't know. I feel like if I see my opponent miss a shot and react a certain way to a shot, I know that he's frustrated or, um, you know, that sort of stuff. So, like, maybe it will give me some additional confidence or more belief that he's thinking about things. Versus, like, if I see him miss a shot and there's zero reaction, you know, um, then it's, like, maybe... I don't know if it's scary necessarily, but it's, like, he looks in control, you know? He's, so, not, he's not bothered. Yeah, he's, he's not bothered by it. He's shaking, but... Like, that's one of the things that I feel like I've been doing. It's it's weird because there are times where someone will miss a shot and he, they'll be frustrated, but you, you can sense that the frustration is, like, they're making that shot the next 10 times in a row. But it's other ones where they're frustrated because they can't believe they missed, like... I don't know, you like, if someone is, if you're attacking someone's weakness and then they're frustrated or something, you know that they're insecure about something versus someone who, like, if I miss a sit or volley, you can sense the fear as opposed yes, to the frustration. Exactly. Yeah. So it depends. But I think that's something I've been doing a lot better recently is like just always try to show the opponent that I'm in control, that I'm like, I don't know, like my body language and that sort of stuff. Every now and again, it, it, I, feel when I react a certain way and I'm like I probably shouldn't show them this like mm. I think Josh and I were in the finals of Jamaica the last week and we were up a set we had break points in the first game of the second didn't break so we had like one all or two all in the second and Josh is like freaking out and I'm like okay I don't understand why we're freaking out because we're already up a set and we're all over them in the second but even if you are freaking out, just don't show them, you know, like from their perspective, they're under a lot of pressure. So now you don't, we don't, you don't want to show them that we're frustrated, even if we shouldn't be frustrated or whatever, which I don't think we should have been, but like, 
So I think that stuff matters. Like, I, I believe it's underrated as well. I agree with that. And in school, we had a fitness coach called Coach Bell. His his thing was like, after every set of whatever we do, never hands on knees, never lean on anything. Keep the, the good posture so that you you train being exhausted and like holding that, that strong body posture. So never he was screaming like, on land, on the land. Like we were, we all die if we don't want to do it. But you have to kind of fight that. And I think that's a good, I think that's a good lesson too. I think boy language is definitely underrated. Yeah, but then this guy is dying every single match. He's winning every match. Like, he's like Murray, you know? Like, when you see, when you see him die, it's like, yeah. he's going to win. Like, he will win, you know? And you have the exceptions too. Like, I think when you have the flu or you're dying or you heat exhaustion, I don't know if you can actually control that. But just the fact that you don't go down is like, that plays in the other guy's head too. Yeah. And maybe it can work the other way too, like with Murray, when he's always like complaining and stuff. Maybe it's to get in the other guy's head too. So I don't know. It's an interesting uh, mental game you can play with your opponent sometimes. The next one I got for you is routines slash superstition. Over underrated. Mm, these are some good, some good <laughs> over unders. I'm going to have to go with underrated again. Um, I've, I've, for me personally, whenever I can get into a good routine during the week of a tournament, I'm always more successful. What kind of things are you thinking about like to your kids what time i'm waking up you know trying to be trying to wake up consistently at the same time what time am i doing my mobility what time am i playing my match um then my recovery and doing all the things to get ready for the next day kind of fall into line so i would say my best weeks like jamaica and the dominican and sometimes it's out of your control you know the uh, uh, supervisor could put you on first first match and then the next day put you on last and then your routine's totally different when you wake up but um those two tournaments I was playing like 9 30 every morning so I would wake up at six pour a coffee half awake zombie go up to the gym in the uh Airbnb do you know my 40 minutes of mobility and roll out jump in the pool and swim a bit you know then have breakfast I would already have my bags packed, go to the site, hit, you know, shower. And everyone's different, but for me, this is what I was doing. And then play the match, um, have lunch on site, go back and just chill, you know, for a couple hours. And for me, I, I felt like the routines, it just kind of mashes the week into one. It just makes it go smoothly, you know. It all flows together, whereas if you have a night match and then you're first on and it's just you kind of – all over the place um so i would say routines definitely uh underrated especially like pre-match routines you know what are you doing to get in the right uh get your body ready your mind ready these things really matter you know once you get to a certain level and um i would say all the top guys in the world have pretty um consistent routines and i'm sure they're pretty disciplined with them so yeah. underrated. I think it definitely gives you one comfort, and then, like you said as well, with the thinking, like probably take some of the thinking out of things for sure, and then maybe save some energy for you as well. Yeah, yeah. Like when you are always reacting to this to your environment, it's probably more tiring and more, I don't know, off-putting for you. Definitely. To have balance here. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you superstitious or are you just a um a little bit, but nothing crazy. Uh -huh. Like in Jamaica. I had oxtail for the first time. It's so good. And so... My area food. That's yeah, good. man. Jamaican food was unbelievable. That's why you was crumbling out there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But um, that week I ate the same thing every night. You had was, oxtail every night? Yeah. It's, it's honestly a bit... Uh, yeah. Or, oxtail rice and peas. Some yeah, plantains. some veggies, some plantains. And it was just like carbs, protein, and it was good. But then I ran it back the next week as well. And the night before the semi-final i was like i just can't i just i'm gonna throw up thinking about it and so i got like some chicken sandwich and uh lost the next day oh, so, wait, so, I, know, I know i had two more days to just keep it rolling and suck it up but you overrated it that time i know exactly <laughs> exactly so i'm yeah underrated superstitions yeah. if it's gonna keep you on track and keep your mind at ease just roll with it you i think it depends on the person uh, for you specifically, for me, I'm not sure. 
I, I would say in some ways, um, routine is good for me. Like we talked about in the last podcast, things like going to sleep at the right time and waking up at the right time. Like when you go do that consistently, you recover better and feel better for the next day. So those things matter. And probably also like your routines of like recovery, but that's more like discipline. That's more like, so I think that's important, but in other ways, I don't really know. Like it, sometimes it can add pressure. I think depends on the person. Like if you know that you've done every single thing, one person may be like, I've done everything and I have to just go out there and work my ass off and compete. But then the other people who maybe like, I've done every single thing. Why am I not expect? Why am I not? Yeah. They expect just because they did all of this, maybe they deserve a result. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like look at, look at the, the bunch of players I'm sure in the top two, 300 that are less professional than others that are just, they just know how to win. They just go out there and they win tennis matches. So I think it depends on the person. And I've been admittedly less disciplined this year than I have been in the past. And <laughs> it's a little better. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But but I will say though that it's it's easier to be less disciplined physically in doubles. Like if I was this way in singles, I'd be destroyed every week. Yeah. Like my body is not. Um, if I have to go out there and play three, four singles matches this this week, maybe I survive for a week or two. But to do that over and over and over, I probably wouldn't be in good enough shape mm-hmm. physically. Um, but yeah, with that being said, like I I just think it depends on the person. Like I've just been enjoying the week and. I've actually, the thing is, is my motivation hasn't gone down because I feel like I would be excited to just go on court and play a bunch of hours. Like I love practicing and I would just go out and practice a bunch. So I don't know. It's just been, I guess, less disciplined with the fitness mm-hmm. part of, of it, I would say. So another one for you. Yo, can you just double check that he's in the frame on this camera? Okay, okay, okay. Another one for you. Uh weeks off slash recovery and start with that like how important is our weeks off and recovery uh i'm just gonna have to go underrated again okay um and i'm only speaking from my personal experience but uh i can't do more than four or five weeks in a row i just need to reset um for me i love tennis and i i love this journey that we're we're on but i also appreciate other things in life i have a great partner shout outs to brooke um you know and that's the lowest series when you say partner partner, that's when you know (laughs) shout out to the partner yeah shout out on the internet yeah (laughs) for the world to see but um you know it's like for me i'm not willing to neglect that you know i i have things that i try to balance and i also think that part of for me, you know, my what I want to try to do, I, I need to improve my game. My game's not good enough to be top 50 players or top 100 players. So I need these training weeks where I can go and work on, like, my second serve on the ad side was, you know, whatever my coaches and I think that in that right, specific... I play you, yeah. Serve on the side. <laughs> hey, I just worked on it, though. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's going to be good for these next couple tourneys. But, yeah, I think... It's like a rat race, you know, it's easy to get caught up in, oh, I've got these three weeks with no points to defend. And then, you know, and you just go, go, go. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the level, you'll never make it. And so I really think that um, you have to put the time on the practice court and be intentional with what you're improving. And also for me, the burnout, you know, just needing those couple weeks, you know, after four or five weeks on the road to play some golf, to hang out, you know, to do the fitness. And so uh, for me, underrated. Question for both of you, because you both had a pretty good year up to now. How do you manage the rest, the recovery weeks with your form? So like I said, you're playing well and you want to kind of capitalize on your form. How do you reconcile with maybe taking time out from this good run and resting? How do you, how do you rush that in your head? How do you go with that decision? Uh, for me, like I set out at the start of the year that I wanted to try to play 25 weeks at the minimum. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like I'm playing good and my results say that I'm playing good, but I just have tried to commit to what I said at the start of the year. And 
um, not focus too much on, you know, riding a specific wave. Whereas looking at like, if I want to make Grand Slam qualies, like this is the long-term thing. So that's for me kind of what I've been doing. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it because it's different for everyone. But for me, like I said, I don't have the level to beat top 50 players yet because I've played top 50 players and I've lost. So I know that I need the training weeks and I need to Im improve my game. Yeah, uh, I would say like, it's interesting. Last year, I was on a little run in doubles with Josh um, and Carlos. I think I won back-to-back -back 25s and final of 15. But it was at that moment, it was my fifth week in a row. So I was like, I, and the next few weeks where I was in Egypt were relatively weak for what 15s normally are. But I was pretty tired, like mentally and physically. Like every day in the last week, I was like struggling, like struggling to practice, struggling to play the matches, but we were winning. We ended up losing in the finals, like 10-8 in the third. Um, and then I decided to go home. Um, and then I went from having a good little run to the next like month and a half or so I didn't really have any results so I started second guessing like maybe I need to just push it and stay until I literally die like take advantage of the confidence and the, of the run and the momentum because sometimes you win matches strictly on momentum I feel like you mm -hmm. just it just doesn't cross your mind they're gonna lose a match today and you just go out and win you know yeah um but then equally I've spent weeks where I'm I'm really tired and I stay longer maybe and I break down so I, I don't know I don't know what the the answer is, but like, I think, especially in doubles, it's hard enough because I believe doubles players have to play more weeks on the road. So I have to learn this at least in, yeah. in the next, uh, pretty soon coming up because I'm trying to play more than 25 weeks. Yeah. I've already played a bunch this year. I don't know how many weeks I've played, but yeah, it's crazy. Oh, I learned that. We talk about Sega men. Like these guys, they won, I don't know how much this year, probably 50 plus already. Is. Yeah. 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 Halfway through the year and, Every week I look, he's somewhere. Yeah, he was yeah. over in Europe playing the the grass courts, and now he's this week. He's in Bloomfield Hills. I think he qualified a singles, or he was in last round quality singles. He's playing dubs too. Yeah, some of these guys can just go, and I don't know if that's sustainable over. One, With him, it's impressive it's because he's played crazy. singles and doubles. But the doubles guys play a lot a week. Like I know a lot of doubles players that play like they'll go literally like two months every single week play the tournaments. Like the most I've played is five, mm -hmm. and I agree with you. Like after five, I'm Done. To yeah. us, you like know. after Jamaica, that was my fifth in a row, and I was like ready to get out today. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's for dubs. I think you kind of have to just because of how the points are structured, and it's like so tough to make it in dubs. You know, I I heard on your guys' pod you already talked about it. Guys, okay, listen about. Hey, yeah, hey, like, you guys are. You Someone listen. Hey, go buy some merch too. Yeah, go buy some merch and go buy a pro stringer. <laughs> Shout out to Ruben Statham. Um, hey, it's oh, your is he's, uh, hey, it's, yeah. it's your podcast now. Uh, um, but yeah, dude, I, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll, I'll be on whenever you need me. But you guys were talking about segment over the last twelve months, and shout out Ryan, he's a great guy and he's crushing it. So I'm happy for him. But the amount of matches he's won and he's just broken top hundred is scary. You know, it's dude. it's so tough, and so I think for Dubs. The way the points are structured, you have to play 35 weeks a year of like challenges and challenges is different city every week. You got to fly and it's like, whew, it's tough when you get to like 150 Actually, and you're trying to you make that jump. You think it's equally as um, expensive, like the challenges now, because you have to travel week to week to different cities? I think so it still, it still is a step up because of the housing aspect of it. I think it's more expensive to play on the Challenger Tour because the flights are like the main expense that we have to deal with. And when you've got last minute flights every single week, you know, you could spend $2,500 on flights in a month. Um, whereas I'm playing Futures, I can go to the DR and I can fly there for $400, get an Airbnb for two weeks for $800 and then fly back for 600 it ends up being a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, but it depends on where you're playing and how you're doing it. For me, I 
try to go to spots that it may be a little bit cheaper and I know I can camp out for like two or three weeks in a row so I don't have to get those multiple flights but um yeah the challenger tour the different cities every week uh yeah. can become very expensive I was gonna say also going back to segment two the reason why it's impressive in my opinion is because he's also playing singles it's not like yeah. he's just playing doubles only like you play all these weeks in a row of four matches in a week you only have three days off but then you also include the singles matches so maybe he has at least winning matches it's not like he's just losing first round he's a yeah. big guy so you would think that there would be some sort of like issues maybe with getting hurt or whatever yeah. but he yeah wasn't there a week in mexico i think they won a challenge on clay and he drove that day and played singles qualities against Kuru on hard and won singles qualities that same day. Yeah. Acapulco, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I, I was there from Mexico City to Morelos. They won the dubs, yeah. hopped in a bus, came with the trophies. You know, he jumps on the bike, and then he goes out and serves 20 aces. So yeah. I think We're, probably his serve helps a lot true. with that longevity. You true. know, must be nice, Ryan, if you want to lend me that ball <laughs> for just a couple weeks. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he's he's so good. Singles yeah. and dubs, yeah. just such a good player. And you've had a, a good year this year. What do you think has led to the consistency and results and performance this year? Um, Good question. Uh, I'll have to say, like, my coaches, just a shout out for sure. You know, it takes an army to improve and put in the work. So I have a great team around me, Vivek and Miss Jerry have helped me a lot develop my game. Um, so I, uh, this year in particular, I'm not really sure what's clicked. I'm definitely trying to be more aggressive and trying to attack returns and serve and volley. And that's... Um, so like half volley and balls coming in like... Yeah. And madness. Oh, Just clapping people. <laughs> yeah. I think... I don't know if my skill level's really improved that much, but I think knowing or playing the right way you know can take you far and so really trying to play the right way day in and day out because I mean we played each other you know back in Cancun and I think you gave me the chop or it was a three set break oh, was it was like 10 in the third or something. oh was it okay okay <laughs> anyway Jody definitely got the best of me but I my school level hasn't really improved that much but I think when I was playing a couple years ago or last year, I would wait for the guy to miss. You know, that would be my game plan to just outlast the guy and play a lot of defense. And at some point, unfortunately, that's just not enough. And if you want to crack the challenger tour and, you know, try to get wins there, you've got to take the points. And that's been the big shift kind of this year is how can I, because I don't really have a huge weapon. You know, I don't serve like you guys or, I have a great return, which I would say might be my weapon, but how can I, with what I have, how can I take points? So I, I've learned to try to sneak in, you know, because I have good hands and that's a strength of mine. But I would say my, you know, not that I've had like an amazing year, but, you know, this year being my best year, I would say a lot of that has come down to just playing the right way and shifting my mind and how I want to play is it a decision for you to play that way or is it like like did you have the capability of playing this way last year and were you trying to do that or you weren't trying to do that last year i just think i had the capability but i wasn't intentional with it i wasn't really aware of it um another thing that i feel like really has improved in my game is like my ball for ball awareness like Maybe last year, as an example, I would roll three backhands on the service line, you know, cross court, and I wouldn't really notice that that's not a good enough ball. You know, whereas now I'm like trying to return on the baseline. I'm ball for ball, really aware of where it's landing and the depth and everything. And um, I think, yeah, I mean, when I watch Alcraz and these guys who are just, you know, scary level and, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to obtain that level but the ball for ball striking ability and the depth and everything is unbelievable you know and there he's returning his very serve and he's putting it you know this close to the baseline every time and i'm out here you know returning rolling. 90 miles an hour serves like rolling on the on the service line so it just yeah just learning to play the right way and just becoming more aware of little things like depth and you know my balls any of that to do with 
let's say fear let's say you're missing or is that all just being aware for you um i would say part of it was is fear was fear you know it's something that i really have to be intentional about before i go on the court because it's not natural for me to four or 30 or just rip a forehand plus one you know it's i grew up playing pretty defensively I played college defensively. I played on, you know, beginning on the futures tour defensively. So something that I've had to, you know, just, you know, say effort and just do it because I know in the long run, this is what it takes. This is what the top guys do. And I would say a lot of it was fear, like being scared to lose. And so, you know, it's like that balance between I care, but I don't care. You know, can I be more focused on the growth of my game rather than this match in front of me? And it's tough, you know, sometimes that balance comes easily and I just am able to be loose. And then sometimes, for whatever reason, I just, like, want that match so bad, even though there's no difference, you know? They're both worth two points and $200, you know? <laughs> but this is just human nature, so... Like in the grand scheme of things, like, you get two points, so you get zero points, it's not a difference. You know? No, so no. You want to get you know a lot of points you know? yeah so yeah it's true at the city open last year you had a really good win against kudla how did you approach that match were you playing more like tennis you were talking about just now where you were going for it or were you also just kind of fighting and getting no maybe catch him on a bad day yeah i mean i think i got a little bit lucky there i did catch him on a bit bad day it was really hot and that was like the first time that I hadn't died. You know, I outlasted my opponent. He was kind of like, he was really hurting. Um, <clears throat> but no, that was kind of like the start or the first tournament where I had this changed mindset and I was like, you know, look, I, I got I to gotta change something up. You know, I'm 700 in the world and not that that's bad. You know, I'm proud to be, 700 you know coming from New Zealand and all these things but I just knew that if I wanted to keep going up and up and up I, I had to change something so that tournament was a I would say kind of a turning point for me and I'd been injured the whole last year that was my first tournament back and so right. I think another I had no expectation you know I was just like I couldn't believe I'd gotten in I got in found out I got in the day before and my coach and I flew up and we didn't get our hotel till 11 p.m that night you know I got Chipotle and just you know we're just like so happy to be there and I just played so well and I think a lot of that was because I had no expectation I was just like everything's a bonus you know if I get a set off Kudla like sick <laughs> then I'm like serving for the match I'm like what Fuck. <laughs> and then you know I somehow win the next match seven six in the third eight six in the breaker in kuzahara okay. um and it, yeah it just like just fell into place but being able to play with no expectation is so difficult because we all have our goals and we expect you know this but trying to manage that as well and having the freedom to play it's something that really helps but it's something that's really difficult to obtain how do you deal with the opposite so now that's playing someone who's in the top 150 whatever and then this week probably you're gonna play first round someone right below you how do you how do you keep playing the same game style with the same let's say freedom when you're supposed to win are you good at that um it's something that i'm trying to i'm mindful of mm -hmm. um but yeah, I just try to keep the perspective of the growth and like the overall goal for me that seems to release pressure, you know, knowing that this week is important and I'm really going to give it my best go to have a good week, but this week doesn't define my career. And so I always try to keep that in the back of my mind to, uh, I guess, relieve some of that pressure. But I've definitely had moments where I'm like, I gotta win this match like you know this guy and it's this is the not the right way to think but this guy's like this is his first ATP point am I gonna be the guy to give him his first you know and and I'm like juice he's like three points away and I'm like pushing on the service line I lose the point I'm like dude you know the, what are you doing you're, you're back to the old ways but 
this is human nature, man. It's it's tough, and it's trying to like have the self mastery is something that's cool about this journey. Yeah, real. I had that feeling uh, last time in Tulsa. Okay. One of the guys, I I believe I didn't look at his results, but I was under the assumption that he didn't have any points. He's not yeah. worth. <laughs> uh, basically, they were a wildcard team in dogs. Right. I, I mean, it was a strong tournament. They were a wildcard team, and I knew one of them had points, so I figured that the other one didn't have points. But we ended up losing 15-13 in the third. Oof. We're like, on match points, I dove for a volley. Like, full out dove, full out and volley, and missed the volley and lost. We had like three match points, I think. But like, that definitely crossed my mind too. Like, every now and again, it crossed my mind. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's tough, and... I'm sure it's all relative to where you're at, but it's probably an internal battle that goes all the way up to the best and the, you know, the Carlos's and the yeah. Sinners. And I've heard uh, Sinners coach just talk about, you know, how they just focus on the day to day and trying to maximize that day and not worrying about the results. And if you can instill that mindset and it helps to have a good team around you who, you know, supports that and is emphasizing that. But this is a battle that, we face in the Futures Tour, and I'm sure everyone's facing it all the way up to the yeah. Grand Slam Finals. I was talking to Kova, I guess, two weeks ago. We were training in Derry. Okay. And he said he has that feeling too. Like when he goes now and he plays a, let's say, a 250, and let's say someone puts out against him, he, someone puts out, now he's playing somebody 400 in the world first round, and now like the draw is his. He's supposed to get through that little quarter or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, oh, shoot, now he... he he feels that, and so it's the same thing as if you go and play tomorrow someone who's unranked or whatever. And he said he feels the other way as well when he's the one playing somebody seated first round. He can tell that they have a little bit of, of uh, I don't know. They feel the moment that they're supposed to win. So I think that that's just never really going to go away. I think it's just going to have different different levels to it. Yeah, right? definitely. Let me tell you. Sorry, Cole, if you're watching this, you're probably not watching this, but if you are, Medvedev definitely felt that today. The man, <laughs> wow. Medvedev, Medvedev was hitting the ball well, brother. Let me see. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Dude, I was, I was hoping Kova was going to get through that. On grass, I just was like, I don't know if Kova serves well, but I guess Medvedev's just tough customer like on any surface. Real. And it's funny, like, they were talking, the commentators were talking about Kova's slice and, like, Maybe I'm not exposed to like the top level of tennis that much, but I feel like Kova has a good slice and the commentators were like talking about it like he needs to improve his slice, he needs to get his slice better, like through the court attack. They, they were just court. talking. <laughs> commentators. They were just saying things, talking about his return grips and that's they were saying that's he changed the work on. Yeah. Bro. But they were saying about his slice, like it doesn't they were saying like it's not going through the court it's not attack. And I'm sure Kova is probably just like anyone, he's going to want to improve everything. He's going to want to get better at tennis in every aspect that he can do. But, like, I don't know if I would class Kova's slice. But for me, that's a bad peeve. When I listen to the commentary at some of the tournaments and the way they talk about players as if these things are just... Yeah. Sometimes they make stuff up that I don't think makes any difference. But sometimes they talk about certain things as if it's supposed to be easy. Yeah. Like, you know, and uh, I can't listen to commentary sometimes. Yeah, it's tough. It's like, I heard McEnroe today just like <laughs> shitting, <laughs> shitting on everyone, dude. Yeah. It's Mark like, tough, I think anyone who's not like Djokovic, Federer, and the Yeah, dude. Is like, it's a journey, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah man. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. That's true. So it's, yeah. Anyway. I felt the same way about that, too. Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure in some ways McEnroe is uh, insightful and stuff, but then it bothers me when. One of the greats are playing against someone like, I think it was Rinky was playing Nadal at US Open one year. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, is Rinky like, did Rinky one of him being at Dominican two weeks ago or whatever? Yeah. Did Rinky learn tennis last week? Like, what's yeah. going on? Bro, Rinky's top 100 in the world. Come on. Bro. I know. It's, it's pretty ratchet. So, Johnny Mack, if you're watching this, bro, you got to chill out. <laughs> Commentary. For real. For real. KP said it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Love these boys. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, going back to also to the, I believe was it during COVID time you played a bunch of UTRs or was this after COVID? You were playing a bunch of UTR tournaments. I remember watching, um, some of the highlights and stuff you post on your story and that sort of stuff. Did you play? What was the reason for playing these these UTRs? Um, yeah, during COVID, 
Uh, I think <clears throat> during COVID, I was able to play exhibitions, which was really nice um, in Atlanta. And then after COVID, I think I had a couple points. So I probably was just wanting matches and the money was great, you know, and you get the live streams, you can go back and watch it. But yeah, I mean, UTR with the PTTs, I mean, they really have made a huge difference to a lot of guys, you know, who maybe can't go full-time on the Futures Tour or need matches. So for me, yeah, it was, um, I think I was just wanting matches and, you know, trying to get some funds and stuff like that. Yeah. I feel like you improved a lot. Like, I remember you from before COVID, like Cancun days, like you're talking about. Like... He was very good at Cancun. What are you talking about? <laughs> I just remember him being less good than now. I'll put it like that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think you were a bad player by any stretch of the imagination, but I didn't think that you were going to be a guy winning futures and doing what you're doing now. Yeah. So with respect, respectfully. No, no, <laughs> hey, hey, it's a compliment yeah, yeah. because, I mean, there's a lot of guys who you see and you just don't quite see, you don't see it, you know, and then next thing they're like top 100 and you're like, what? Because like, for me, yeah. the result was, I don't know if it was a UTR or what it was, but it was around COVID time and I heard you, you beat Donald Young. Mm. I don't know what, like yeah. in Atlanta somewhere and I was yeah. like oh shoot KPB don't and I was like okay then the guys must have improved a lot yeah what what was your time in COVID like were you you have, you have access to courts you were training a lot like yeah. did you get to improve a lot during that time definitely um, I was super blessed during COVID I um, found Heath Waters who was my coach for like three or four years um, through that time and his wife was 30 in the world and so he is really world-class coach and he taught me how to serve properly like my serve's still not like you boys or the top guys but you know I can actually do something with the serve now and I swear you were serving like a million balls every day like every day on the yeah stage, see, like, yeah seriously serving yeah every every practice we'd start with serves you know and he has this thing called the serve cycle where you have to swing it off to the side fence, then T, and then you have to swing the T on the ad side and then flat wide. And you go until you get four in a row. And at the start, it would take the whole practice, you know, and then after a couple months, I would get it in like five tries, six tries. So, I mean, I in my opinion, you have to have a serve that can hurt your opponent if you want any chance to make it. You know, you don't necessarily need like a Berrettini serve, but... Um, so, yeah, or a Sega, or a Sega and serve. McGinley serve, not McGinley serve, or a Justin Roberts serve, but, um, yeah, I improved my serve, and I had access to courts, and then in Atlanta, they set up these exhibition things where I got to play Donald and Eubanks and all these guys, and so I was getting good matches, and I think the win over Donald, I had just been training, like, really hard, and, you know, and I think maybe during covid he hadn't had that same opportunity you know maybe he was a little bit rusty but it's yeah so humbling, but yeah well honestly that's it's everything that's worth <laughs> no i mean honestly like i gave him the snip you know and that and they if... <laughs> but then i call him humble what am i doing no no but then but then we played we played four times him. Him. but then we played four times since and he's got me every time oh, you know oh, so okay. yeah. yeah but yeah. I'll get you next time, D1. <laughs> we actually might play in a few weeks, so that would be fun. Exhibition? It's like uh, the Atlanta 250 each year has like a wildcard tournament, and they have four of them, and then the winner of each four play off a couple of days before, and then the winner mm -hmm. of that gets into qualies. And so last weekend, I, w I won one of them, and he won the first one. Nice. So last year we played. Sweet. Sorry, say that again. So not there'll be four winners, and then and you then guys all play for one wild card for one quali spot on the the quali start Saturday, and I think it's the Wednesday Thursday. Okay. Yeah, but yes, though COVID was great. I was able to work with Heath Waters and that is worth. Cool. Yeah, okay. it was yeah. great for me. I, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> honestly, it was not a good time. All right, cut that. Cut that. <laughs> honestly, COVID was great, man. Best thing to happen to the world. <laughs> No, for us during COVID too, we were practicing. Justin was practicing. I promise you, like eight hours a day. I was like, really? and mine was on the ball machine. I think for like maybe he would go like three hours, four hours straight, like yeah, just in a row. It's like dog, no, just that's why I started getting hurt. That's yeah, really. Yes, yeah, it. Watching TV, 
cool out. Yeah. I was hungry though. It was the right uh, intention. I guess the problem is we didn't, know, we didn't know how long it would last. Like you, we just there every day. And no- yeah, we know if it's gonna be six weeks or six months or. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. It was so much uncertainty. And then didn't they do the transition? Didn't they do something crazy after COVID to like a transition tour? Before, right? Oh, it was before. It was like, I oh, believe it was before. It, because I remember I couldn't get into tournaments. What year was that? 2019? Something like that? I don't know. Yeah. But it was before COVID. 2019, okay. COVID, yeah. 2019 I think it was just tour. Yeah. Crazy time in that. Yeah, that was, that was nuts. That transition tour just like was well, never going to work. I don't know what they were. Who do you train with in Atlanta? Like, players wise. I train with the uh, college team where I went to college. Okay. Um, shout out Coach Isaacs and the Columbus State Cougars. Um, it's a great setup. It's it's not the best setup. You know, I'm not getting to train with challenger level players, but it's everything I need. You know, they're really good to me and they let me use the facilities and you know, we can take players and practice sets and whatever we need. So, yeah, it's a good set. Now we to play with anyone like Eubanks at all or not really? No, no, because actually I live in Columbus, Georgia, which is an hour and a half south of Atlanta. Okay. I just say Atlanta because nobody knows where Columbus <laughs> is. But um, I was living in Atlanta during COVID and it was great. I um, was able to practice with Donald and Trent Bride and, there were a lot of good players in Atlanta, Ryan Harrison at that time. Um, so uh, yeah, it was it was great for the tennis, bad for everything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's go. Let's go to. So talk about a little bit about goal setting. So you said at the, earlier that you one of your goals. I, I don't know if this is a loose goal or was that you want to play the slam qualities. Yeah. So at the beginning of the year, how much is that on your mind in preseason or in planning and that sort of stuff? Like, is it like a ranking goal? Are you strict with it? How, how do you set your goals, like short term and long term goals? Um, yeah, definitely the Grand Slam cues is kind of the the goal, um, and then just knowing that you know I need about two hundred and seventy points, something like that, to get to two thirty in the world. Okay. Um, you know, just looking that up and then that way I can kind of, it's like a roadmap, you know, I, it doesn't mean that I'm going to get there. Um, but I can see, okay, I need to eventually do well at challenger level, you know, because then I need 50 points in a week or 40 or, you know, 75. So, uh, that's kind of the goal that <clears throat> my coaches and I have set and I th- I like to think I'm a realist, you know, I'm 27 years old. Do I think that I'm going to win Wimbledon next year? Like probably not. No, you know, but do I think that Grand Slam qualities is obtainable? Yes. Do I think it's going to happen hundred percent? No, you know, it's a small chance and it's tough out here, especially when father time right now is like, you know, the thing that's the biggest challenge, um, so, I mean, that's the goal, and I don't put too much pressure on it, but it definitely does motivate me, especially when I have to travel to places that I know I'm not going to have the best time and I'm going to have to hustle for practice courts and we're not going to get, you know, it's just going to be a grind. When I have that in the back of my mind and I'm like, okay, this is why I'm going there, you know, I take it on the chin and just work hard for those two weeks and get out of there. So, for me... What's that? I know, I know. Honestly, if I could just travel with some oxtail, I just <laughs> straight up the rankings. So, uh, along with your uh, result goals, what are your process goals like? Do you have many of them, or you kind of try to pick up one thing at a time? Um, I say my process goals are more so uh, what I talked about earlier about like the developing the game and trying to commit to playing the right way. Um, and that's really this year what the process goals have been, Mm -hmm. you know, can I play this match and can I take the point on break point, you know, and then I'll play it and I'll go back into that mode and I'll be like, dude, you know, you didn't do it, but this is all part of it. So the process goal is definitely important. And for me, it's just committing to trying to play the right way. 
Uh, lastly, before we get into um, a game, what is it like playing Davis Cup, like representing your country in New Zealand at Davis Cup and also the 250 in Auckland at home, like having, you know, I guess home support and home crowd support, you being one of the few Kiwis on tour. So what are those week weeks like for you? Do you look forward to these weeks and how impactful has it been for you to be able to play these kind of tournaments? Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing um, and it definitely leaves me feeling inspired and motivated. Um, in terms of Davis Cup, it's just so fun to play for something bigger than yourself. Um, tennis is just a really selfish sport where being selfish gets rewarded um, and I don't love that about the sport, you know, um, but Davis Cup, you come together and not one person is bigger than the goal to win that tie or is more important. So I love it. I'm proud to be from New Zealand. I'm proud to be a Kiwi. And um, yeah, Davis Cup weeks are always, you know, great atmosphere and uh, a week I look forward to. And uh, as a Kiwi, we're very lucky to have the Auckland 250. Um, we have like two futures there and then we have a 250, you know. Yeah. So um, I've been very lucky these last two years to... Uh, play the main draw and get that experience and um it's huge you know to start the year you know just being surrounded by you know where you want to be and the guys who are you know in the top 50 and seeing what they're doing in the gym and what they're doing before the matches and it's just really informative and it's very inspiring because I feel like the gap between the futures and the challenges and the ATP tour it's not huge but if you're always, you know, in between futures and challenges and you never see or play against the ATP tour, it feels like, or it can seem like these guys are on a different planet. They're not human. They're way too good. You see the highlights on YouTube. But when you have that experience and you actually get to play against them, and even if you lose, which, you know, I have lost the three ATP main draws that I've played, each time I've left feeling really inspired and feeling like the gap is not that big. And so I think it's a blessing I've been able to experience it, but I think it's really important to have that experience because the gap is not that big, you know? Can you explain also what it's like inside, like what you just described about to see how they are, like in the locker room or in the, like when they're with their coaches or training, that sort of stuff. How different is it than than that, the futures and challenges. How, like, can you notice difference in behaviors? Do they train any differently or do they talk any differently and that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. like these top players? It's a good question. I would say I haven't really noticed that much of a difference between the Challenger Tour and the ATP Tour. And I guess that makes sense because a lot of those guys are kind of in and out of both. But definitely the Futures Tour and the ATP Tour, <clears throat> there, uh, um, there are some differences that are you know, really noticeable. And like one that I've noticed is just the gym work, you know, they're all in there every day and it's not like they're, you know, maxing out on squats, but they're all doing their mobility and, you know, I'd be in there and I would see, you know, almost every player in the draw roll through there. And some guys, you know, everyone's different, but some guys would be in there doing assault bike, you know, really intense, like Ben Shelton was, and he was doing clap push-ups, and it was okay. really, yeah, it was, re and this wasn't like right before his match, this was leading into the tournament, okay. it was very intense, but then you see guys like Monfils, who are more just about probably trying to be sustainable, and he's biking and just getting stretched, but they're all in the gym, and I'll go to a Futures, and we don't even have a gym, you know, yeah. so. Oscar said that today, Oscar was like, um, bro, what is with these tournaments and there's no gym here? I was like, are you high maintenance or what's going on? Yeah. Like, we've been at Futures with no gym. Like, this yeah. Is not we got some bikes, though. That's not too bad. Some bad bikes. Yeah. But yeah I saw some, some mats, yeah, in the ground. Some spinner bikes and some mats. No showers, though, I heard. No is showers. That... I don't think Ooh, that's tough, man. Guess what? No pool either. Excuse no pool. <laughs> I'll be swimming in my sweat. <laughs> Yo, what's up with, with, with the, the Aussies and the Kiwis? I feel like the different vibe of that little part of the world like i feel like you have you have watched a little bit of this um what's it called life on tour with uh dane sweeney and uh Cal Callum Bob Bob yeah like there's a very on one hand you guys have a very you're very self-aware like here you talk 
you're very aware of your emotions and life and the journey and all these things. You get that's very apparent. Realist. He called himself a realist. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like it almost almost spiritual. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. But on the other hand, you guys are also you seem to be a little bit wild. Like Yeah. You don't know like into the surf and the uh, yeah, clinchy. Clinchy. You have yeah. a clinchy type, you have a curious type. Like what is it about that part of the world that makes you guys so I don't know. It's like a dichotomy there. That's a crazy word, but there's like I don't even know what that means. Can you try to dichotomy? <laughs> wow. He's really out here like that. <laughs> I'm a podcaster, I guess. You know? But like on one hand, you guys are very aware and very spiritual. I don't know if that's the right word. But then at the same time, you guys seem also very wild. Yeah. No, that, I mean... If that's even fair. No, I think that. that's totally fair. Yeah. And that's a good observation. I'd say, like, we're so isolated from everywhere else in the world. Um, Australia is a lot bigger than New Zealand. But New Zealand's, you know... I mean, you guys know island life and mm. community and, you know... Y- you know your neighbor so i think there's definitely that aspect of just trying to be a good human being you know and that your actions do affect other people and so i think like dane and i mean callum especially he's really aware of that and he's very spiritual in that way and i think it's just something to do with like the isolation and knowing you know everybody around you and and then the wild side, I mean, you'll probably have to ask Clinchy about that. Clinchy um, <laughs> may be the wildest person I know. I think he, yeah, he's a legend. Shout out Clinchy, we love you. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just maybe because we're on an island, it's pretty boring at times. And so we find crazy things to do, whether it's like kayaking out to an island and having a few drinks out there or, you know, it's something just like that. It's just an adventure. It's yeah. cool. Like if New Zealand is small, like Antigua is small. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. You say yeah. It's not Antigua is small, but New Zealand is not it, small, bro. No, it, it's not, but it, but it is at the same time. Okay. Um, like you guys, you guys all love the banter. Like I don't know, yeah. from that part of the who's not down with the jokes and being a little bit, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. And I really like, when I see the Aussies on tour, they all stick together, you know, and I really respect that. And that's probably the one thing that kind of sucks about being a Kiwi is there's just not many of us on tour and there's not really camaraderie, you know, like I haven't, I don't know when the last time I saw a Kiwi was probably Ruben in Mexico. And just, um, he's, is he playing doubles now? Is yeah, he he's, doubles? he's strictly dubs and he's playing, you know, only challenger tour. And unfortunately I'm, you know, not quite there yet, but it would be great if, you know, we had that same kind of bond and unfortunately I don't really feel it like I see it with them, yeah. but, you know, all good. That's true. It's it's all the Antiguans out there either. So I know, so you can relate. Yeah, you try to get the Caribbean connections to them. Though. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, question? Or no? uh, we have one question from Instagram. Um, Charlie Hudson asks, what's your best memories from junior tennis in New Zealand? Wow. What's up, Charlie? Um, that's a good friend of mine growing up. <clears throat> My best memory of tennis in New Zealand growing up would probably just be all the training sessions at the RPC, our local t- training facility. Um, uh, we had It was just all of our friends, and it wasn't a professional environment at all, but we had so much fun at trainings, and we just honestly played games the whole time, mm-hmm. start to finish, and then we'd play rugby touch rugby at the end yeah it was fun it definitely uh wasn't the environment to shape and carlos alcaraz but we we enjoyed it you know and i think maybe that's why i haven't burnt out because you know yeah there was no you gotta be a pro you got it you know we didn't talk about that we just like all right like let's enjoy it let's play rugby let's let's you know have a good time before going to college did you know you wanted to play professional tennis absolutely not um I yeah I never there was never really a talk about being a pro for me um I was always a decent junior and I was never the best in New Zealand in any age group but I played consistently you know from 10 to 18 and um I wasn't even going to go to college I was going to go to uni back in New Zealand and just stop tennis um I my parents really encouraged me to go and you know, they said you can always come back if you don't enjoy it, but if you don't go, it's gone. Um, 
And then I just fell in love with like the team environment and college tennis and just the camaraderie. And, you know, I actually got on like a weight program and started doing the gym and just slowly I just started improving. And, um, and then, yeah, by the time I exited, I was, I would say like an average futures player, you know, I would quality most weeks, but I never made it really that deep. And it's just been a slow journey of like, uh, personal growth and, you know, trying to be aware and, you know, understanding that I'm not Hemothy, you know, I got like heaps to work on and yeah. just being okay with like the fact that, you know, it's okay to not be amazing, you know. It's true. Charlie also asked, do you remember how much he carried you at Palmy Tournament 16s? No, oh my gosh, I do remember that. <laughs> God, I can't believe your back is still functioning after that. Um, <laughs> I remember the car ride back with your mom after, um, yeah, so many good times in junior tennis, and um, yeah, tennis in New Zealand's not a huge sport, but um, it's definitely a fun one, and if you're a parent out there listening, I would definitely encourage you to get your kid involved, because it's, uh, it's a great sport. Real talk. All right. You want a game? game time. Game time, baby. I got five questions for you. Dog, my anxiety goes up every time we reach this part of the podcast. But we're going to do it. Are you no math questions? There are no math questions this week. So we got basically a first of three. First one, you get three questions right, wins. You shout your answer out. If you guess wrong, you have to wait until he answers until he gives a guess. And then you can guess again. Okay. And if you both get it wrong, we'll move on. I'm going to be so bad. Just, uh, but first, first to three. Yeah? Okay. And if, and if we end up... If you get something wrong twice and we end up with a 2-2, come, two, come on, they got a little tiebreaker. Come on, I've never lost a KP in a mouth. <laughs> <That's a day, laughs> that's uh, dang, that's true, actually. <laughs> Guy's got my number. Question one. This year, who won the Mallorca 250? It was last week. To be low. Yes. Come on, now. <laughs> come on, now. He also won Auckland. Or... No, no, I did. I, I saw that. He's top 20 now. Question two. Madness. Sorry, go on. Do you watch women's tennis? No lie. <laughs> I could do a better job of it. I could do a better job of it. Who is the one number two in women's tennis? Coco Goff. Wow, this guy's killing me. What the hell? I just saw she is number two in Wimbledon on the oh, draw. Really? So. But Wimbledon doesn't do their... You see, this is it's messed up. Wimbledon doesn't do their draw according to the ranking. They don't. You know that? They have their own system. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. They, 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 they can see whoever they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they have their own system. So they, Crazy. they take the HP rankings and WT rankings into account, but they also have their own, like... Uh, yeah. Question three is not tennis related. What are the three primary colors? I'll Red, let... blue, and yellow? Yes. Wow, nice. that's cool! Nice. Oh, let's go. Oh, we find it. We find it. Let's go. I had to let you on the board with that one, mate. <laughs> two one, two one to the kids. Yeah. Go on, sorry, go on. Go on. I'm gonna let Jordy answer this one first. Okay. Okay. Fair. fair. S- spell Marozan. So Fabio Marozan, tennis player. M. Yes. A. Yes. R. R. O. Z. C A N Marazan. Am I saying it right? Marazan. Is it the sentence? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. The spelling bees. Um M M A R A Z no Marozan. Yeah, yeah. You wanna try again, Jody, or are you good? You were close. I feel like you were one letter off. M A R O Z. I don't even remember what I said last time. Then you said C. You said N. I'm gonna Google this right now. I get. I tell you. No, no. I got it. I got it. M A R O Z E N. Why would we not say Z S A N? Z S. We gotta move on from that. Move on from that. Two one soon. I would have never got that. Who is the only player to beat Novak Djokovic at all four Grand Slams? The doubt? No. I think I'm going to win it here. Is it Wawrinka? No. No. <laughs> now you, 
Anyone's game though. God. Anybody can answer. Damn it. It's got to be Feds. Surely, it had to be one of the big three. I don't know what I was thinking with Wawrinka. Why would I not just do that too? Why would I not just go Fed Nadal Djokovic? KP uh, got his first, first W, w baby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> right. KP, thank you, you for joining us today. Oh, thanks, so thanks for having me, guys. Like I said at the start, you guys are crushing it. And it's great to see these things aren't easy to do, you know, and you guys have kept consistent with it. So, you know, the sky's the limit for you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Good luck yeah. this week and good luck for the rest of the year, bro. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.